the molecule CNO minus one. When we start thinking about this uh, molecule, carbon makes the most number of bonds. Nitrogens and oxygens can be on either side. So we have a basic structure. Carbon brings four electrons. Nitrogen brings five. Oxygen brings six. That's a total of 15 electrons, but don't forget that minus one charge, plus one more, 16 electrons total. Two, four, go into bonding. We make those connections first. Six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. Now, what we can start seeing is, okay, yep, yeah, we need to make some double and triple bonds. How would I know? Well, I could look first to the octet rule and say carbon doesn't have it, or I could look to formal charges and say this is a minus one, this is a plus two, and this is a minus two. No, minus. Yeah, minus two. I did that for you. Math. So when we're looking at uh, this, we know that we have to give some more to carbon. So the first thing I'll do is let's just share. Let's share one there. And what that gives us is a little bit better scenario. Minus one, plus one. Let's share from the oxygen. Let's just share evenly. Maybe you guys think, yeah, let's start there. And that would give uh, overall, this structure. Well, that's great, right? Nitrogen having a minus one charge, carbon being neutral, oxygen being neutral. Quickly do those formal charges. But then what I would, could propose is, well, instead of that, does this fit? What if I just wanted all of the electrons to be shared from oxygen, not one from either side, but all of them from the oxygen. Or what if I wanted the nitrogen to share and do all of those bonds? Here are three resonance structures that are quite different from each other. So now, which one's the best? Well, we want the one with the fewest formal charges. That's the first rule that we would look for. And that crosses this one off the list. Because of the minus two and the plus one, we know that one's not a good resonance structure. We shouldn't see a minus two and a plus one when we see other options for our resonance structures that only have one atom with a formal charge. The second thing that we want to think about is that the most electronegative atom likes electrons. So they like to have formal charges that are the minus. So when we look at this, oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. So our best structure is this one when oxygen gets that minus one charge. This one is the worst that we crossed out because of having multiple formal charges. This one is the middle. Excellent. Again, practice problems. You can look at those formal charges, start to identify when things have a formal charge or when they don't, and be able to rank overall N2O is a neutral molecule. Dinitrogen monoxide is neutral, which is the best resonance structure, and which one's the worst? Well, we know we have to have at least two atoms with a formal charge. We can automatically say this one, when all three atoms have a formal charge is the worst. Then we'll look between A and B and say, well, who should have that negative charge, the nitrogen or the oxygen? The nitrogen should, or the oxygen should. 
because he's more electronegative. Couple of wrap up things. These would uh, be conceptual questions when we start talking about bond energies. Now we presented this at the very beginning of our lecture today. Um, these uh, values that we'll talk about with bond energies would always be given to you. You do not need to memorize them, but we need to make sense about them. What is a bond energy? Well, in a chemical reaction, um, a bond energy is going to be the amount of energy uh, that it takes to break one mole of a bond in a compound. Breaking bonds, again, requires energy. Forming bonds is what releases energy. Now the overall delta H of a reaction can be estimated. The overall bond energies exchange with a reaction can be estimated by comparing the cost of breaking old bonds to the income of making new bonds. So what we can look at with delta H of a reaction is really just uh, the amount of energy for bonds forming and bonds breaking. And if we know delta H is negative, that's exothermic. This is old material that's still important. If delta H is positive, that is endothermic. Uh, trends in bond energies. Um, in general, what we see is that when comparing like atom to atoms, so carbon-carbon bonds, a triple bond is, uh, costs more energy than a single bond. That makes sense. There are six electrons here to pull apart. There are only two electrons here to pull apart. And again, these values would be um, on a table, but what we would know is that triple bonds are stronger then double and single bonds. Why? Because there's more electrons in those bonds. Uh, and on, again, uh, when we look at that idea, um, we can start to think about triple bonds are holding those two atoms closer uh, together, their, their attractions are tighter, and so triple bonds are actually shorter bonds. Then double, shorter, then double and single bonds. We can look between single bonds and, and um, see some differences as well. If you think about um, bromine fluorine bromine chlorine and bromine bromine again the size of the atom getting bigger what we see is the bond length gets stronger um, and when we think bond length gets stronger we remember our uh, red rover discussion um, it's easier to break those bonds so we'll see that the cost is lower um, so as we again look at this table these numbers you would not need to memorize but you should know that a triple bond is going to be a higher bond energy than a double and a double is going to be a higher bond energy than a single. Uh, when we look at the size of the atom um, connected to um, a particular uh, uh, element, so looking going down a group as size increases, bond length increases, and so bond energy decreases. Uh, we can use those bond energies to calculate the average delta H of a reaction. We will do this in class. Um, here is the equation that we will use. Um, bond broken is going to be that positive value. Bonds formed is going to be the negative. Um, making bonds is exothermic. Breaking bonds is endothermic. So when we look at this, we can also think about it as broken minus formed. Uh, if we want to use this chart up here, these are all the bond energies. Uh, the cost for breaking. Now, the income for forming these is just the negative. 
So you slap a negative on it if it's formed. You would use the positive if it's being broken. Um, again, covalent bond reality versus Lewis theory. Uh, Lewis theory predicted that the more electrons two atoms shared, the shorter the bond would be. We see that in terms of um, bond length. Um, it's determined by measuring the distance between the actual nuclei of the atoms. Uh, in general, triple bonds are shorter than double, um, and double bonds are shorter than single bonds. Um, we can also look at the size of the atom. Chlorine is bigger than fluorine, bromine is bigger than chlorine, and iodine is the biggest out of all those halogens. The bigger the atom, the uh, greater the distance between those nuclei. The bond length increases as well. So here are some average bond lengths. We see that they should correlate what we thought. Um, triple bonds are a very short bond. Uh, double bonds are a little bit longer. Single bonds are a little bit longer. Um, these are averaged. Again, you would not need to memorize the number, but you should know the general trend. Uh, here's some trends in bond length. Again, what we see, triple bonds are shorter than doubles. Doubles are shorter than singles. And that's because of the increased attraction with six electrons for our triple bond versus our four electrons for a double versus just the two electrons in that attraction for a single bond. Uh, generally, bond length decreases from left to right across the periodic table. Again, as we go from left to right on the periodic table, atoms size decreases. Um, and as we go down a column, what we just talked about, atom size increases. So the bond length increases. Um, and in general, as the bonds get longer, they also get weaker meaning their bond energy decreases. Doesn't cost as much to break them.